today's um, a fabulous opportunity, at least from my perspective. Uh, uh, I'm uh, Dr. Robert Lampard, and I've been fortunate to have been born in Red Deer the day after my mother arrived. Um, but that's only part of the story because I have an identical twin brother. And, um, my ex you know, the truth is, I, uh, he kicked me out, so I, uh, I'm one of a, of a set of twins. Uh, but it does take me back in Red Deer's history uh, quite some time um, to be able to say that um, Red Deer has a very short history. Um, and I, as I've said to a number of my friends, if it doesn't grab that as it passes through, it'll lose it too. <laughs> so to start today, we have um, um, one of Red Deer's remarkable citizens, uh, Jerry Tennant, to um, tell us a bit about his, why he came to Red Deer, because almost everybody has and uh, what he's done in Red Deer and some of the highlights of, of his life and time in Red Deer, which goes back a long way and certainly from a, um, uh, looking at the community from a, um, an individual point of view and some of the things that we've been able to achieve in that short history of ours, uh, Jerry has been a, a very significant part of it. So Jerry, would you like to tell us a bit about uh, what brought you here and, and um, uh, particularly some of your family uh, highlights, which I found quite intriguing. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bob. Uh, yeah, my connection to Red Deer goes back probably to the late 40s after the Second World War, when my grandparents and uh, an aunt and uncle moved here. Uh, I moved here basically in 1960, uh, straight out of high school. I was born and raised in Stettler. Uh, my family immigrated, my dad's family immigrated to that area in uh, East Central Alberta in 1904. He was six months old. Uh, for some reason, my grandfather, who had one eye and, and one hand, decided to leave England and come and eke out a living in, in East Central Alberta as a farmer with five children, two more after they arrived. Uh, so they had uh, a tough life, but they, uh, they made it through. And uh, uh, I was uh, born in, in Stellar, 1942, just during the war, and uh, grew up and took all my high schooling there. My mother's family immigrated from the States in the 1920s, when my grandfather on that side and his brother uh, went out to the same area in East Central Alberta and ran threshing crews, and uh, then stayed in that area up until the time that uh, and my grandfather and my uncle both joined the uh, the cavalry tanks in the Second World War. My grandfather lied about his age, got in. He'd owned restaurants, so they sent him as a cook up to London. Uh, just an off, uh, quite a, an interesting story. He wanted to get in on the action, so he tried to sneak onto a landing craft for the Dieppe raid, but got caught and was sent back up to, uh, to London as a cook. So uh, my family has a long history in the central Alberta area. And uh, I came to Red Deer in 1960 uh, after graduating high school. And I'd, uh, although I'd visited here on a number of occasions and uh, to visit relatives, but I'd always had an interest in radio. Television wasn't a big thing back then, but uh, when I was in high school, we did a, a program on the radio station in Drumheller, CJDB. And uh, I was one of those chosen from the high school to go and I read the news. And the news, of course, was about Stettler High School and what was happening in Stettler. And so I got the bug. So I decided I wanted to, do, uh, to be in radio. And uh, I, my uncle in, in Red Deer had a connection. He worked for AGT and he had a connection with the people at the radio station here, CKRD. So uh, I came over on the bus. And the first thing I did was went to the unemployment office. And because back then they found you jobs and they said, oh, we can put you in a bank right away. We get your job in the bank in Nova Scotia. And I said, no, I want to be in radio. So I found my way to the radio station, uh, met one of the fellows there who interviewed me, and they didn't have any jobs, but I said, can I use you as a reference? So I sent letters out to different radio stations. And a few days later, I got a call, and he said, a friend of mine just came through. He's with CFSL Radio in Weyburn, Saskatchewan, and he's looking for a continuity writer, which is a commercial writer. Uh, that had been one of my strong points in school, so uh, short, uh, long story short, I ended up in Weyburn, Saskatchewan for three months 
then I came back to Red Deer and worked for CKRD uh, radio and television for uh, 21 years. Well, you're just, just listening um, to you. Uh, keep, um, I'm amazed our paths didn't cross before they, they finally did, but uh, um, some of your stories remind me of how difficult uh, early farming was in Alberta. Um, my uh, father um, left the bank and uh, went farming just south of Stettler and unfortunately was killed in a farming accident. So my grandfather is born in Stettler too. Um, your comments about the Calgary tanks, um, uh, yes, they're named Calgary, but uh, a lot of them were from around Red Deer and that was because the hiring criteria for them was you had to have worked with big machinery and anybody yeah. who worked on a farm was deemed to have, uh, have worked with big ma machinery. And, of course, it was the Calgary tanks that um, ended up on the Dieppe raid, and we could tell many side stories about that. Um, but there, there is one I, I think you mentioned uh, briefly to me about your wife. I'm sorry, not your wife, your mother, and uh, how she uh, ended up coming to Red Deer and, and how you ended up uh, as part of the family. And maybe you tell us a bit about, uh, about her and that, that unusual episode. Uh, well, my mother's family, as I said, came from the States. Uh, as a family, we were really involved in Stetler in the community, and that's sort of where I've got my, uh, uh, I guess, the decision to get involved in community activities. Uh, my mother was involved in church activities. My dad was in the community band. My brother and I were in scouting. We were involved in sports in, 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 uh, in Stetler. And uh, so the, the move to Red Deer because we had family here was uh, was something that uh, was easy to do. I stayed with my aunt and uncle. <laughs> One of the, the, the funny stories, I guess, when I got here was about my mother, but uh, I was involved in scouting in Stetler for many years and I was what was called a, uh, when I was in scouts, uh, a cub instructor. So I worked with cubs. My uncle was a scout uh, a cub master here in Red Deer at Knox Presbyterian Church. and. When I arrived from uh, Wayburn, Saskatchewan, eventually got here by bus. He met me at the bus at uh, six o'clock on a, uh, a Monday night and said, guess where you're going tonight? Seven o'clock, I was down at Knox Church as an assistant cub black leader and I stayed there ever, ever since. So <laughs> that's how I got my, kept my involvement going in the scouting movement. But uh, my, my mom was, uh, was a very uh, intelligent woman. She went to, uh, normal school. She went to uh, a couple of uh, business schools. My dad was a carpenter. He worked hard and, and uh, provided for the family. But uh, mom was sort of the, uh, the mainstay in the family and uh, kept things going while dad provided the, uh, the income. Um. You, I think you mentioned that one of them was a war bride or one of your... You know, that was my, my wife's family. Uh, my wife's family came to uh, Red Deer in the 1920s. Her dad finished his high school here at Lindsay Thurber in about 1934, I think it was, and uh, joined the Army in 39, and he was in the Second World War as well for six years. He was with the artillery out of Edmonton and saw action in, uh, in uh, Sicily and Italy and Europe. And he met uh, my wife's mother in England, and they married, and so she was a war bride. And my wife tells me she remembers stories of, uh, of hiding under the stairs uh, when the bombs were dropping. She was about three years old, and uh, she's always been uh, a little claustrophobic in small places, and she wondered why. And she found that's, that's why they hid under the stairs as the bombs were dropping. And uh, then they got to Canada, came up across in the Queen Mary and landed in Halifax at, uh, I think it was Pier 13 or whatever it was, and made their way by train across here and farmed uh, in what is now the Glendale area and uh, till they sold the farm to my wife's uh, great uncle and then uh, her dad took jobs in, uh, in other areas in the city. So she's been here longer than I have. She's been here since 1946. Um, yes, yeah, there, there are quite a number of war brides that came back to Red Deer. Um, I certainly remember um, our um, 
camp supervisor at Camp Woods. Uh, um, she was a war bride, Mary Mary Helen Wood, mm -hmm. and uh, she and we'll talk a bit of more about scouting later. Yes, but, uh, um, there are a lot of connections uh, um, because of the war, and I think of my own parents uh, and how the war so dramatically affected them. But Jerry, tell us a bit about um, some of the highlights of your time with uh, CKRD and then the, with the TV station that, that followed. Yeah, as I said, I, for some reason, I thought radio would be a big career, even though my uncle tried to dissuade me because he, he didn't think there was much of a, uh, of a future in it for, for, uh, for anyone. But I was determined, and so I joined CKRD as a writer in 1960. Uh, and then shortly after that, uh, the, uh, the Purnell family owned this station at the time. Shortly after that, they sold that to uh, uh, Henry Flock and Gordon Spackman, and they then bought the TV station uh, that was out on the East Hill and moved it into the city. And so we had a combination of radio, CKRD radio and television. Of course, that time, CKRD was the only station in Red Deer. There were only about three in central Alberta. I think Drumheller would ask one, and, uh, or sorry, Drumheller cameras in Red Deer. Uh, now there's seven or eight, I think five in Red Deer and probably up to ten in the in the area. And uh, of course the TV station was uh, was out in the East Hill until they moved it into town. So over my years in radio, because it was a small station, and I had opportunities to move to other communities. But I, I had started a family in Red Deer. We were married in 1963 and uh, started having kids and uh, we had a home. So I didn't really want to move. So I, I stuck with with radio. I moved around. I was an announcer. I was a salesperson. I was a technician. And then we got involved with the TV station. And uh, uh, I ended up, uh, uh, my final job in, 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 in business was in sales. But I also did a kid's TV show for five years, a live TV show called Captain's Cabin. As we were discussing earlier, that's why I grew my beard. <laughs> because I figured the ship's captain had to have a beard, and, and I found a, a, a captain's hat, and the show went on live. For, it was half an hour, I think it was every Thursday at 4.30, and uh, we had uh, cartoons, Sinbad the Sailor cartoons, and a puppet named Seymour the Sea Serpent, and we had a fan club of 2,500 kids, believe it or not, so we'd give away prizes. And so that was sort of a highlight. Uh, and then the other highlights of my career in radio and television were, number one, the people I worked with, great people. Uh, you didn't get paid a lot, but uh, I, I really enjoyed the work and enjoyed the people and enjoyed the things that we got involved in in the community. And there were a lot of things. Every major event, the radio station was there, of course, promoting it, whether it was at the Westerner or was with uh, some of the major uh, sport organizations that would hold tournaments. I remember going out to the Lacombe Lions Ball Tournament every year, which is a big tournament, one of the biggest in Western Canada, and broadcasting out there. Uh, just getting involved in community activities uh, sort of stead, uh, stood me in good stead in, in later life when I became involved in recreation and culture because I made a lot of connections within the community. So uh, I really enjoyed the career. As I say, you didn't make a lot of money. And one of the reasons I <clears throat> finally decided to leave was wasn't really any pension plan. And, <laughs> and uh, when you have a growing family, you, you need to look after them and, and have some... Uh, security for the future. So that's why I uh, left radio and television and was fortunate enough to join the City of Red Deer Recreation Department. Um, the um, uh, Recreation Department, actually the precursor of it was, was called the Athletic Association. And when Dad came back from uh, the war, um, he realized that now that he had a, a family that was growing up, that um, a little more attention needed to be focused in this small town. I think when we were born, it was about 2,500. Um, but the focus needed to be on the youth because there were going to be a lot more young kids coming along because of the uh, baby boom. So he and, and Alex Sim uh, started the Athletic Association in 1947, and uh, they voluntarily um, did a lot of work to, to uh, get it started. In fact, I can remember uh, uh, there was no gym so um, my father um, drilled a hole in one of the um, joists in the basement and hung a, a, 
a, a bag, a, a duffel bag full of sawdust from a, for a boxing bag. So, so our heart could uh, start, uh, you know, his, his boxing lessons, and you know, that family went on to quite a significant boxing history. But that's how it got started, and eventually uh, they hired the first <coughs> recreation director, Jarvis Miller. Yeah, you can um, if you carry on from there, because it certainly was a. Uh, foresight on perhaps on dance part, but uh, certainly perfect timing because uh, Reggie needed it. Yeah, when when I joined the department in 1981, uh, Don Moore was the at that time called the recreation superintendent. Uh, we had uh, in in the department the, the recreation department at the and the parts department were were two separate departments. They later joined. And the culture, there wasn't a department, there was a cultural section within the recreation department. So there was community programs, there was athletics, which I was involved in, and there was the, uh, the cultural and then aquatics. So there were maybe 10 of us that were involved in, in the programming. Uh, but over the years, of course, as the city grew, and the department grew and the facilities grew, uh, when I came to Red Deer, there was, uh, and started with the department, uh, there was, one swimming, indoor swimming pool, which was the downtown one. In the early uh, 1990s, I believe it was, the, um, the outdoor pool was built. And the, one of the first things they hosted was the Canadian National Diving Championships. And there were a couple of local divers that were involved in that. Mm -hmm. And of course, back then, of course, it's uh, the same thing. Yeah, I think there was uh, uh, the downtown arena and the 50s, 60s, and into the 70s probably was the only arena until they started building some of the new arenas, uh, the Kinsman Community Arenas, Kinex, which of course was one time in the winter, in the summer it was a barn for the Wester, in the winter it was an arena. And uh, uh, over the years, uh, as the need grew, so did the, the facilities. And uh, of course, one of the first ones that was uh, built that was sort of outside of the ordinary was the Daw Center. And uh, that was uh, unique in the province in that there were the two school districts involved in the city. So we had St. Pat's School and, and the Daw School and then the Daw Center in between had the, the arena and the swimming pool and the, uh, the library and some meeting rooms and the little fitness center. And it, uh, it was unique in that the schools use the recreation facilities during the day and the community was able to use the schools for community programs at night. So it was sort of a joint effort. Uh, there was certainly foresight on, on yeah. Harold, Harold Dawes' part and, and now they're uh, ex expanding it again. They're expanding. There's another ice surface coming in, a larger fitness center, an outdoor spray park and some other uh, amenities that will really were needed on the north side of the, of the city and uh, will uh, enhance the facilities up there as well as for the rest of the city. And of course, now we have, I think it's five pools, indoor pools, eight indoor arenas, seating anywhere from 200 to 7,000 when you think of the Centrium, and, uh, and, and a lot of other facilities. Because over the years, uh, when I was young, you played ball in the summer, you played football in the fall, and you played hockey in the winter. And Basically, that was the way in most communities. And then as communities grew, there were some emerging sports that came about. You started getting things like lacrosse and ball hockey, soccer. When I started in the department, my kids were some of the first that started playing soccer. And I think there were 50 soccer players in, in Red Deer. Now there's well over 2,000. Mm -hmm. So some of these emerging sports, of course, needed some more facilities. And so uh, the... Uh, they became more what we call Class A ball fields. Great Chief Park was was built, uh, and even a little controversy over the name, you may remember, <laughs> but uh, it's sort of the jewel of the uh, softball, baseball, football. And uh, then the, uh, the Cullicut Center came about in the, uh, in the early uh, 90s, I believe about 1991. No, sorry, it was after that. Um, Forget exactly the year, but the Cullicut Center was was built about that time. There were a uh, a number of uh, communities that were starting to build what they called multi-sport complexes, and the Cullicut Center was one of the first uh, built in Red Deer 
housing, of course, uh, indoor soccer, the fitness center, the uh, uh, the arena, uh, indoor soccer fields, uh, meeting rooms, and really served a, a need in, in terms of uh, developing some of the, uh, the facilities that were needed for some of these new yeah. sports. Well, Red Deer is certainly growing and uh, it's fabulous to see how much their recreation department has expanded and grown itself. Um, um, I, I won't get into the controversy about Great Chief Park, but I will mention <laughs> the Great Chief was uh, Chief Mascapatoon from Wetaskiwin, or the Peace Hills as they were known. Yeah. And the chap who wrote the book on him was our neighbor, a uh, chap better known as Kerry Wood. Oh, yes. So uh, Absolutely. I have some uh, softness for that title, or at least one that would favor it. Um, the other is, of course, I hope in our interview series that we will be able to include Don Knorr, yeah. who's had such a demonstrable effect on Red Deer, uh, particularly in uh, orchestrating the uh, establishment yeah. of the park, the park system yeah. uh, for Red Deer. Um, but, uh, Jerry, do you want to comment, um, if you would, on, on some of the major events? That, because we've had these facilities Red Deer has mm -hmm. hosted, and, and some of the uh, people who've uh, gone on to significant uh, sporting successes uh, because we've had the facilities uh, on which they could train. Yeah, absolutely. I guess backing up a bit in, in terms of the development of the facilities, of course, uh, one move that happened uh, was uh, in about 1981-82, the Exhibition Association, the grounds that were downtown, moved to the South Hill. Mm -hmm and uh, moved to South, to South Red Deer. And at the same time, uh, the, uh, the Centrium was, was being built. Uh, and uh, so once the facilities were out there and the, the major, the Centrium was built, completed in 1991, the Rebels started playing in 1992. And then of course, over the years, they've added more and more to that facility. Uh, the Prairie Pavilion, the Parkland Pavilion, and a number of other buildings. So that now it's probably the largest uh, complex of its kind under one roof in Western Canada. And it's meant a lot to the community in terms of uh, some of the uh, sporting and community and cultural events that can be, can be held there. But uh, in, in terms of some of the major events, of course, uh, because of the Centrium, uh, Red Deer uh, was able to host the uh, World Junior Hockey Championships around 94, 95, followed by the Briar, followed by Sport Canada. And that sort of put Red Deer on the map. Uh, we'd hosted Alberta Summer and Winter Games, in fact, when I was uh, first in, in radio. Uh, in 1975, Red Deer hosted the Alberta Summer Games, which is one of the first summer games held. And then in 77, because no other community stepped forward, Red Deer hosted it again. And I was involved in both of those, in one as the, uh, the first one as uh, the chairman of the hospitality committee, and the second one as director of sport. You do a great job at that. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 so, and, and that got me involved in a number of other things as well. But uh, the, uh, the facilities that we have, of course, have enabled us to hold major events, not only multi-sport events, like the Alberta Games, the Canada Winter Games, of course, which we just held a few years ago, and which also helped to uh, develop some additional uh, sporting facilities, uh, upgrades at Great Chief Park, at uh, uh, the new speed skating oval, upgrades out at River Bend with the cross country and biathlon trails. And, and now we have the new sports facility at Red Deer College. And of course, the Red Deer College, yeah, I was going to mention that as well. Uh, with the advent of the college and some of the facilities there, and now with the new Gary W. Harris Center, uh, it's got even, there's even more opportunities. And, and it's a great center and it's used for community. I, I go and watch my grandkids play hockey. They're just about every weekend. I have four grandkids in hockey, so spend a lot of time in hockey arenas. But Red Deer has become known as, a, as a, uh, an area and a community that has the the facilities and the volunteers to run these major events. And uh, not, not only, as I say, the multiple uh, events, but something like the Canadian Pickleball Championships who were just held with the new pickleball. Uh, you know, who would have thought a few years ago, pickleball would be such a, a big sport, but we have that marvelous facility up in the uh, 
uh, northeast corner of the city there and it held the championships. We've held the rigors, have held the national baseball championships. We've held uh, uh, provincial and Western Canadian and national championships in a number of other sports as well. So Red Deer's has done well. And, and now after the, uh, the Canada Games, there's uh, uh, an organization uh, that has been put together with some funding from that that will be promoting Red Deer along with Tourism Red Deer as a major sporting and event and cultural center in uh, in Alberta and in Canada. So I sure come a long we way. We have come a long way. Yeah. Um, are there some individuals that uh, have, um, you know, I guess in the sporting and recreational field have, have gone on to exceptional careers uh, starting in Red Deer or Central Alberta? There have. Uh, you know, there, there are a number that have uh, graduated from uh, ones like the old Red Deer Rustlers and recently the Rebels and in the recent years and of course gone on to the NHL uh, and have played in the NHL and then we've had a number of athletes uh, in figure skating, you think of Jamie Soleil, uh, a number in speed skating, the Weatherspoon family. Um, so yeah, there have been a lot of uh, athletes that have become well known. There's also uh, a number of um, uh, individuals from Red Deer who have made their mark in, in, in the cultural and in, uh, in the uh, performing arts and in, in movies and in uh, uh, people have gone to Red Deer College, not necessarily from the city, but from the Central Alberta area, who have gone on to great things in, in, the, uh, in television and, and movies. Mm -hmm. in uh, the uh, cultural and uh, fine and performing arts. That's certainly been a very um, significant part of the uh, college's program. I, I think of, uh, you know, it's sad that he's not with us, but Keith Mann, mm -hmm. who became internationally known yeah. for the, the Red Deer Royals and the, and the, the band uh, groups and, that he put together who won awards around the world. The Royals have been real ambassadors for the city and uh, yeah, they've traveled the world, they've done really well, they've won numerous awards and prizes. And so it's just one of the, the many facets of the city in uh, recreation, cultural, and then of course, our park system, uh, the Boston uh, Park system and uh, all the trails uh, we're known for our trails and for our facilities in that respect and, and for our trees. Uh, I've had Friends and family come from other parts of Alberta and the states in Canada. Never been to Red Deer, and I tour them around the city, and they're just amazed. Number one, at at our facilities, our cultural facilities, our sporting facilities, but also about the number of trees. They said some of them said, "Oh yeah, we've driven past Red Deer, never been in," and they're just amazed at how much parkland we have and how many trees and things like the Carrywood Nature Center and Bower Ponds and Waskasu Park System and. Uh, uh, Heritage Ranch, all those things that make Red Deer such a great place. And when I was growing up, the um, the, the draw was the, the sanctuary, and, and I can remember my father uh, talking about um, the controversy over what should be a sanctuary because he said Kerry Wood wanted the whole city to be. <laughs> so, and I, did, I, did, I didn't think we could we could handle that. But yeah, we certainly could handle the one. Uh, um, which is part of you know Gates Gates Lake and so on. Now. Yeah, you and I are both old enough. We know where the the original entry to the sanctuary was at the bottom of the uh, yeah. what some people call Mitchell Hill or others call the Fifty Fifth Street Hill, but uh, uh, it's a far cry now from what it was back then. And it's, it's another one of the jewels in 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 Red Deer in terms of uh, facilities. Your your tree comments uh, uh, remind me that. Um, uh, in the early years, uh, back in the tens and twenties, uh, Red Deer um, almost went bankrupt uh, in the early twenties, and then the mini depression had occurred then. Um, so it had no debt and wanted no debt. But what it did for it, and the only thing it did for it, was not paid roads. <laughs> they came later. But um, 55th Street was tree lined. Yeah. With uh, spruce trees. And, yeah. And uh, 45th Avenue was tree lined with, with spruce trees. And, and spruce and, drive. Um, yeah. They were they were uh, hallmarks of the city, and it was really sad to see them come down. Yeah. Year, years later, um, Jerry, are there any comments? Uh, any larger comments you want to make about uh, recreation and culture um, in the city as it as it grew? Or um, we've talked a bit about some of the recreational facilities that you've 
summarized and more particularly importantly been a part of uh, and particularly a part of sharing those with other parts of Canada by holding ma major events mm -hmm. here. Um, and that's done a lot to um, establish Red Deer's reputation. Uh, we, we don't have, uh, like most communities, some really significant people other than perhaps Roland Michener in the earlier years. Uh, um, so, uh, as I've always said, Red Deer's, future, Red Deer's history is in its future. and. Uh, um, we certainly have an exciting future because it's young and youthful and mm -hmm. vibrant and active and has vision and, and has been able to accomplish a lot of things and has had a very supportive community and it's not just in recreation but I'm doing some work on uh, some of the educational history yeah. in Red Deer and it applies there too. Uh, it's a significant part of Alberta not just um, the stopping place between Calgary, uh, Everton. Calgary and Everton, <laughs> where, where you gas up and go. <laughs> you don't even come into Red Deer. <laughs> That's unfortunately true. Yeah, no, I, I think the, uh, you know, credit is due to the many people over the years in, in city councils and recreation boards and other uh, groups and organizations that had the foresight to see the future and, and to recognize that the future lies in in developing amenities that will really benefit the citizens of the city of Red Deer as well as those in central Alberta and the wider provincial and, and national community and uh, uh, keeping facilities, building new facilities, but also making sure that current facilities are kept up to date, whether it's uh, sporting facilities or some of the cultural facilities. I mean, uh, we look at the Memorial Centre, which at one time was a uh, part of the uh, the old army camp and uh, has been around for years and years, but it's still a, a facility that is well used and, and, and well kept up. So uh, there uh, there's lots of credit to a lot of people who have uh, taken the time and effort to really plan out the city and and plan for the future. Yeah, that, that uh, and that's actually not been um, uh, easy to, to happen to put together. And I, I think of my uh, father's uh, comment at the time uh, the United Way was starting in the, in the 1950s and how difficult it was because Red Deer had such a high turnover of good people, mm -hmm. you know, in the banking industry or, you know, with the RCMP and the government. Um, he stayed two years, certainly at the most four years, and the good people left. Yeah. And now it was therefore very difficult to get continuity and get some of these um, volunteer program started and, and, and continued. But you've certainly been involved in uh, for many, many years in uh, a number of them. And perhaps you tell us a bit about some of the uh, volunteer work that you've done, you know, not only while you were with the recreation people, the uh, department, but um, afterwards, now that you're uh, a little more available because you might be retired. <laughs> well, uh... I've mentioned scouting. I started in scouting as an 11 year old in Stetler, went up to the rank of Queen Scout, which is the highest you get there. As I, <laughs> I told my story of how I got involved here in Red Deer through my uncle and, and stayed involved. And actually, up until oh, a few years ago, I'd been involved. So over 60 years that I've been involved in, in scouting. Uh, I was a regional commissioner, a district commissioner, a provincial deputy commissioner, worked on several scouting jamborees. And uh, it, I, I, I learned a lot. Scouting was one of the things that taught me a lot about dealing with people, working with people, being self-sufficient. Of course, the program has changed over the years. And one of the sad things is that it, it's no longer as relevant as it once was. You don't get the numbers. My son is still a cub leader and scout leader. Three of my grandkids are involved. But I had a lot of great times and, and learned a lot through, through scouting and met a lot of wonderful people and a few characters like uh, Denny May, who was Wap May's uh, son, who was involved as, he was on staff. Um, one of the, uh, the great ones is Ernie Coombe, who you would have known, and Ernie was the provincial, uh, he was the uh, staff sergeant in charge of the Red Deer RCMP at the time. That was the highest rank in Red Deer. And he was also uh, went up to the ranks of scouting, was the provincial commissioner. And one story, I remember, I forget where we were going. I was going to Ernie. I was the regional commissioner. He was the provincial commissioner. Of course, he lived in Red Deer. We were headed somewhere, and Ernie had his, uh, it was a, a police car, but it was a, a ghost car. It didn't have any markings. 
and we were roaring down the highway probably 20, 30 miles an hour over the speed limit because we were late and we get pulled over by the, by the RCMP. <laughs> the officer came up, took one look, and, and Ernie pulled out his ID and showed it to him. Oh, thank you, Staff Coombe. Have a good night. Be on your way. <laughs> so he could pretty well do anything he wanted, but uh, Ernie was a great, uh, wonderful per person. And you mentioned Roland Michener, who, of course, as Governor General, was also the Chief Scout of Canada. And uh, he came to Red Deer shortly after his inauguration as Governor General, and I met him because uh, I was involved in scouting at the time at the provincial level and written him a congratulatory letter on behalf of the province and, and uh, met him at... Uh, the uh, reception at the Galbraith's house down in the Woodley area. And then a few years later, he came back through by train and his train was parked at CPR station. And uh, the scout shop where we had our headquarters was just across the street there on 48th Avenue or 48th Street. And uh, one of our fellows there was quite bold. His name was Tom Hart. He went across to the train and talked to the aide de camp and said, no, oh, the scout headquarters is just over here where the governor general like to come and visit. <laughs> he said, well, I'll talk to him. So we went back and an hour or two later, we were having a meeting in the door walks to the governor general. And he came in, he talked to us. We had pictures taken with him, a wonderful man. And uh, one of the moments I'll treasure in my, uh, my years in the scouting movement. The, um, the, the, the... One of the bronzes that we're missing right in Red Deer is the bronze of Roland Michener running the trails. Yeah. Because he was such a great it, it tennis player, been. trail yeah. runner, and outdoors yeah. person. Uh, yeah. Um, and then in, uh, yeah. in terms of other uh, involvements, I've been involved in numerous community organizations, some more than others, uh, with the Heart and Stroke Foundation, which I know is near and dear to your heart, and uh, with... Uh, 25 years as a director and as the president of the Alberta Foundation for three years. Uh, Special Olympics has sort of been my, my go-to uh, activity uh, before retirement. I'm starting my 41st year, 41st year with Special Olympics in Red Deer and I'm also on the provincial board. But uh, I started as part of my job with the, with the city. Uh, I was a liaison with a number of sporting groups and one of them was Special Olympics. And, I sort of became enamored of the program and the, uh, the, the goals and objectives of providing sport opportunities for individuals with an intellectual disability. And I've stayed involved ever since and uh, I took advantage of my offices with the city park uh, recreation department to <laughs> use my office and my computer and my secretary to do a lot of that work. And then when I retired in uh, 2006, we opened a little office down here where we are today. And so I spend a number of hours a day here doing uh, as a volunteer for Special Olympics Red Deer. And uh, the program has grown uh, tremendously over the years, uh, both locally and provincially. And it's something that's near and dear to my heart and I'll probably continue as long as I can. It's uh, kind of them to offer their facilities uh, to us for, for this interview today. Uh, um, I, I, I can't resist, uh, when you raise the, the topic of scouting and Red Deer, um, to think of a few uh, stories um, which Michael Dawes certainly complimented. Uh, um, yes, I, I was in scouting uh, along with my brother, um, and I well remember Ernie Coombs. He was the assistant cup scoutmaster on our uh, uh, trip to the first world jamboree outside North America. It was held in Niagara on the Lake. Uh, yeah. And, uh, I can still remember some of the some of the ditties that he taught us. <laughs> he was, he was a, a very unique character. But scouting in, in Red Deer um, uh, started with really with um, some uh, soldiers who'd come back from the Boer War and yeah. had, had been under um, um, General um, uh, Baden Powell, Lord Baden -Powell who, was, yeah. who was the um, the senior British officer after the after the war. And under him were the Lord Strathcona on the horse, which um, um, gave him contacts with Central Alberta. So he wrote one of them to see if they would start a scouting uh, troop in Red Deer. And um, there's still an argument about where the first one in Alberta was, is a Calgary or Red Deer. But I think Michael would say it was in it was in Red Deer. But the really significant um, 
story I wanted to add was uh, um, about um, 1911, there was a um, uh, lumberman from Saskatchewan who didn't have much more to do, in fact, didn't have a job, came to Red Deer and managed to pull a revolver, I think, on the chief of police. Uh, so the, um, of all people, to um, go look for the guy, they, they recruited the scout troop. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, two scouts, uh, Chad Z and, and Phil Galbraith, uh, found him sleeping behind a, um, a little mound yeah. in where the Western now is. The um, mayor of the city, Mayor Welliver, very uh, kindly and, and appreciatively uh, raised $500 to send uh, the two of them to the Jamboree um, uh, in London, England. Yeah. And when um, uh, Lord Baden Powell came uh, to tour the Jamboree in preparation for the march down to the coronation, um, he stopped at the Canadian contingent. He got off his horse and he uh, pulled um, two medals out of his backpack. His uh, horseback, and he said, Would the two um, scouts from Red Deer please come forward? And he pinned these medals on him, the yeah. highest award that scouting offered at that time. Um, so, those are a couple of the uh, highlights in the early yeah. years. Uh, there was a Cub Master uh, by the name of H.E. Uh, Callender yeah. who ran the Cubs for, I don't know, 40 or 50 years. and. Um, Baden Powell, every time he came to Alberta, wanted to stop in, in Red Deer because uh, his favorite walking stick was the Diamond Willow. Yeah. And every time he came, he got another yeah, Diamond, Diamond Willow stick. stick. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the uh, scout leader in the 30s was Kerry Wood. Yeah. And it disbanded during the war, but my father and mother restarted it after the war. And I have many remarkable experiences that followed from that uh, um, time when dad was the scoutmaster mm -hmm. uh, rebuilding or building uh, uh, some of the youthful organizations that the community needed. Yeah. Um, but those are very fond memories. And yeah. Like you, yeah. I, had, I, had a, I was a queen scout. And <laughs> I had my beat cords and I remember proudly going and marching at the in the Red Deer Parade, yeah. trying, trying to show them off. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. One, of, one of the things that happened in Red Deer was the building of the log cabin, which is now back in the U.S. I think about 1936 uh, yeah. was uh, dedicated by, I think it was Lord Tweedsmuir. Uh, yeah, that would fit. He, yeah, was, the he was the governor general at that time, and of course it served the community well for many years. Uh, we used to sell Christmas trees out of there and, mm -hmm. and had other activities, and unfortunately it's, uh, I, I wouldn't say it's fallen at hard times, I think it's still in fairly good shape, but now it's uh, looking at having to be, to be moved. Or hopefully not dismantled uh, because of the uh, the sale of that uh, portion of the land. But uh, what, what, one other little story I'll, I'll relate in terms of my time in scouting. 1958, I was at a provincial jamboree at Hillsdown Flats, just uh, uh, between Banff and uh, and Lake Louise. There's a big area. There was about I think 1,800 of us there from Alberta at the jamboree. I was one of the older scouts at 16, and one night, uh, uh, late evening, we were called all the uh, older scouts to get together, and we had found out that there was a young four-year-old girl lost on the mountain, and it was um, the the big mountain there that they they renamed Mount Eisenhower, I think, was Castle Mountain. Castle Mountain. Yeah, and By James uh, Hector. Yeah. And so they took, must have been 50 or 60 of us, and we found out along that mountain and on both sides of the road, and we walked through sloughs up to our waist in water, trying to find a, a body, unfortunately, with our feet, and up the mountainside. And uh, we were there all night in the rain, and we were walking in a line across the mountain, and we came to a waterfall, we couldn't cross it, so they called us off. Uh, the happy ending is the next morning, uh, some of the park rangers found her sound asleep. She climbed a thousand feet up the mountainside. Mm -hmm. And uh, she, what had happened, she'd gone to a washroom with her, uh, with her uh, sisters. And uh, when she came out, they weren't there. And she took the wrong turn and went up the mountain. But the end of the story is, about 30 years ago, I was at the 40th wedding anniversary of uh, some friends from our church. And their daughter was there, and she was talking to another gentleman. 
telling her all about the time she was lost in the mountain in Banff. And I went over and sat down, and I said, oh, and here's the rest of the story. <laughs> I was one of those poor guys slouching through the rain looking for you. <laughs> and we've been family friends ever since. <laughs> so there are, there are all those kinds of stories that come about when you least expect it. Well, that um, in some ways brings us, uh, I guess, current um, with some of our own experiences that we've been able to share in this interview, which has certainly been fun, not only going over them and going over them again, but sharing them and, and then to discover how interrelated, um, <laughs> you know, perhaps from different generations, but how interrelated our own experiences here in New York and, and how Red Deer has provided uh, those opportunities. Uh, um, I I, um, I know that uh, when I was growing up, um, either for discipline reasons or because the parents uh, had the resources and thought that an education elsewhere was better, um, the youth in Red Deer didn't always stay in Red Deer. They no. could be sent elsewhere um, on the basis that it was, quote, better. But as I look back on it, uh, um, the experience of growing up and living in Red Deer has been remarkable. And it's certainly, uh, if you look at the population size of people who come to Red Deer, so many people say the same thing. Yeah. It just has a spirit, a community spirit that few have. And uh, that continues, uh, particularly supported uh, encouraged by people like yourself, Jerry. And so it's been a real pleasure to uh, go over some of those stories, see where they, you know, they match and mix. <laughs> and, uh, and the story hasn't and, ended. <laughs> it well, continues. Well, let's hope it does yeah. for, while, for both of us. Um, anyway, uh, I sure appreciate it. Thank you for sharing the time with us, uh, Jerry. It's been illustrative and it's been, been fun. Um, and let's hope that we can find more citizens in Red Deer who um, have a similar experience and attitude of, uh, in, in Red Deer and reflect on how it's grown over, the, over mm -hmm. time. But it's, it's certainly a very significant um, city, and not just in Alberta, but increasingly in Canada, yeah. whether it's the Ron McLeans that, that come from Red Deer or who they are. I've, I worked with Ron. Actually, I sort of gave him his first job in radio <laughs> when he started. And yeah, Ron's been a great ambassador for, for Red Deer. And we have a lot of great ambassadors, maybe not as well known as Ron, but people that uh, have grown up in Red Deer, made their mark on the world in other areas, uh, uh, whether it's medicine or whether it's sports or culture. Uh, and as I say, there's still lots of the story left to be told. I think there's a lot of up and coming people and new people that are uh, making their mark in the community. Well, we'll, we'll have to uh, raise that uh, concept with uh, Michael Dahl and get him to talk about the uh, the Hall of Fame at Lindsay Derber. Uh, um, the increasing, the increasingly lengthy Hall of Fame of <laughs> some very significant people. Yeah. Already there, especially if you look at their backgrounds. Yeah. 